few of them you know so yeah. what how is how is uh, in your country what is the situation okay so we've been in lockdown now for about i'd say it's nearly two weeks um okay. there's probably about 3500 cases i'm not too sure the death numbers i think it's about 17 or 18 um okay. but all schools are closed all universities are closed the businesses are closed um, mm -hmm. and as as you say people are they're staying home and and uh, hopefully mm -hmm. stopping the spread yeah that's the only thing we can do right now mm. right? yeah that's it that's it so, just to, to, to anybody else that's joined john is just setting up the call in the background he's going to be back in 10 minutes and we'll we'll get started then so feel free to say hi and let us know where you're tuning in from yeah of course you are a, a neurosurgeon too i'm not no i i know john through the live video side of, the, of, of, of his work um so we would stream and film conferences from uh neurosurgery to um even uh live surgery um we've done thoracic surgery and and bath surgery that type of thing um, so I, I just love seeing john's work because you you can tell he's busy every day sending out the emails and getting get, connecting the world it's amazing uh, so uh, i'm thankful to you too huh <laughs> exactly Thank exactly you. it's great technology Thank you. yeah Oh, that's me, huh? Hi. Hello. Hello. How are you? What part of the world are you in? I'm Sharia, Bangladesh. From oh, so there you are. <laughs> your yeah, your screen good. changed. Very good. Very good. And and are you working or are you in the hospital or are you off shift? No, or? right now I'm uh, home. Right now home. We are uh, bring our duties in shift. Uh, okay. One or two in the every day, and uh, our turns come after every five days. Okay. And the hospital environment, is that changing? Are they gearing up for what may happen in terms of Corona or is it business as usual? Yeah. Uh, they're trying, they're trying, but uh, this is a hugely populated country. Uh, we have about 160 million people, you know, and in our city, it's uh, one, 150 crore, uh, sorry, one, uh, one and a half crore people. Okay. So lots of people, so hospital are not that much capable of uh, prepare every preparation right yeah yeah we are also suffering we are also suffering uh to yeah service the people but we're trying okay wow um hi richard i see richard's joined us uh richard's uh, in live streaming as well so he's a friend of mine john he's he's tuning in from northern ireland uh, John's just setting up the call in the background, Richard. He's going to start in about 10, 15 minutes. And it's a, it's a daily talk, a daily dose of neurosurgery. And he has viewers tuning in from all over the world. So my friend there was just chatting from Bangladesh. And we have others on the call. Do you want to say hi? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, hi, Richard. I'm Dr. Sharia from Bangladesh. I'm a final year resident of neurosurgery. And I see a lot of kids are working from home today too. That's the same in my house. Very good. Richard, we're live on YouTube now too, if you see the top left of the screen. So Dermot, I take it that uh, is that built into Zoom as well, going live on YouTube? 
Yes, uh, so John has the uh, probably a webinar package, I'd say, or the uh, the package that allows him to do that. Hi, John, I think you're coming online there. Hello, Richard Jolly. John, Richard is a colleague of mine, so he's my business partner. So um, oh, we tra welcome. travel the world, streaming events and stuff like that. So the DRA is trying to take over the associate producer job. <laughs> <laughs> Why not, John? He's just, he's just barging into the studio and taking over. <laughs> I'm buying you time, my friend. I know you're busy in the background. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, John, um, David Doherty is a good friend of ours too. I know you know David. Oh, uh, is he here too? No, he's not here, but... Um... <laughs> yeah, we can have a chat after, you know. Yeah. Let me, uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot I want to talk about uh, in these times, man. Wow. You know, it doesn't really affect my lifestyle that much because I'm at the computer anyways, you know, at home. How about you? You work from home or? Uh, we, well, most of our, Richard will tell you, most of our work is traveling to uh, conference venues and that, but yes, we are experience a lot of people becoming used to zoom and, and it's a great technology to use remotely so um but i know you've been using this years john you, you've been doing this was it yeah, two years yeah. you're in dublin uh, i'm in a place called donegal donegal oh wow it's a west part of ireland right northwest up the top northwest northwest okay and richard is in uh, antrim palomina palomina oh. north of belfast the other side of ireland okay uh, I, I almost came to um, uh, Galway. Uh, oh, yeah. I came to Portugal, but I, I, I didn't go, end up going. But David Darty, have, do you know David Darty? Yeah. Oh, yeah. man, we had the worst show. <laughs> <laughs> I, we, we both, it was like a comedy of errors, you know. And, and, and I don't care because we're new, you know, we're just exploring. Yes. Uh, he and I, First of all, my, my talk was the first one, right? And so I'd never done this before, playing a video on a, li on a live, like in other words, uh, put, not, not doing a live televising, but a recorded one. And I wasn't used to it, the clicking the buttons for allowing the sound on the video. <laughs> video. I didn't turn the buttons on. For 17 minutes, the audience was treated to silence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lucky today. <laughs> yeah, I mean, could you think of anything worse to kill an audience? Give them dead air <laughs> for 17 <laughs> minutes. Uh, then after, we had a presenter that started eating a sandwich while he was presenting. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I, I would go, oh my God, said, this is like Benny Hill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there's some other things I got, I'll tell you later. You know, what sure. I could I can't say now, but they're just really funny. So I, I poor David, I, I probably killed half his audience, but he still <laughs> wants to come back for more. <laughs> oh, he's you know, a great guy. Is great M guy. Health Insight uh, website? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you know tell, that, right? Tell us about your background, John. Like, how did you start this? And and, and even your, your medical career before that? Yeah, yeah. I was in a medical career before that, mostly emergency room. And then I kind of stopped practicing and got into computers and wanted to get back into medicine and saw how much medicine had affected medicine, how computers had affected in, in many areas. Yes. And, I, and then I stumbled on Google Hangout, uh, which you probably did when, it's, when it was around and loved it. I just loved it just from the start. Uh, I uh, took lessons. Remember Ronnie Bincer? I don't know if you remember him. He was big in Hangouts, uh, really big. Uh, I think he worked for YouTube when they started the Hangouts and uh, he advised Google on on things but as you know google just fell away from taking care of it you know so and then uh my my associate said you gotta try zoom you gotta try zoom and so once i tried i said what you know the ease of administration you you know about that 
you know, to have yeah. the board all set up and to be able to schedule it. And, uh, and even though it's simple, some people are impressed. If you send them a link when you want to make an appointment, you, they're like, oh, wow, <laughs> this is really advanced. <laughs> and, and what is the biggest success you've had out of this platform? Neurosurgery. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, well you know, like I, I, could, I couldn't do many things because medicine is so huge. I, I had to confine myself to one area and I just happened to meet <clears throat> some neurosurgeons and Ipe is one of the guys you're going to meet here. Uh, he is a big believer in tech and he loves to use it. And we've been working together ever since on this, on neurosurgery. And, and the thing about this platform is that, you know, the people you meet, I mean, you meet, you know, really good people all over the world, uh, fairly easily. Uh, so we've been doing okay. Uh, and, you know, he's been giving uh, <clears throat> a lot of didactic lectures in neurosurgery and we televise conferences and, um, you know, the, the usual stuff. Yeah. But how about you? You, you? you do all conferences, right? Not just medicine, right? Yeah, we do all types, but I, I love the medical side of things because there's a real collegiate atmosphere to it. You know, you've loads of people sharing case studies and examples and it's it, there's a huge wealth of knowledge and you know connecting people is the real you know the, the real i don't know the real plus of this yeah are you primarily sharing best practice john i'm sorry are you primarily sharing best practice what is best practice i, I don't mm. even know what does that mean what does that mean Okay. Are you primarily sharing, uh, sharing techniques, sharing, just, you're sharing information, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. It's neurosurgery information. It's, uh, it's didactic teaching, like just like you get in a conference room in the hospital. Yes. Uh, it, it pretty well sticks to that. Uh, and, uh, you have uh, regular, regular guests, regular lectures, that type of thing, Richard. Um, do you, you do hospital rounds too, isn't that right, John? No, we, we televise events, yeah. some events from hospitals, um, mostly in uh, India and other parts of the world, because America is kind of tight about what you televise. Although I've televised from Cornell, we had a really good conference from there. Uh, yes. Once you meet, once you meet people in the field, they'll ask you to televise things. You know, if they see if they like what you're doing, they say, "Hey, could you?" televise us here uh as you as you guys know you you get references within the field mostly you, you like you guys probably get a lot of references from people you've worked with right that's it that's it yeah yeah word spreads and um when you're putting out good content people see it and they appreciate it and they, they want to be involved yeah yeah uh, you actually go to the sites right and set up the cameras yeah, and the sound that's richard so richard has a, a full team and um He'll do maybe three, four, five camera type shoot um, with wow. a live vision mix. And Richard, if you want to tell him how it works, fire away. Yeah, that's obviously was for physical conferences where we're making the coverage engaging when we're making it look like a TV, like TV coverage. Right. So that it's really watchable all day throughout a conference, and we do find that our online viewers really do watch all day, um, because yeah, because we keep it interesting. Um, I, I mean, all we're doing is relaying information, relaying content that the that, that speakers are providing. We're showing the slides directly in just the same way as, as you or your colleagues on this call will, will share their desktop and show, show slides um, directly. But what we did last week actually for the, for the first time was, uh, was integrate the two, integrate a Zoom call with, if you like, a professional studio framework. Mm -hmm. in just the same way as I'm sure your TV stations are doing, certainly in the UK, the BBC and all the others are doing right now. They have their presenter, one or two people in the studio. Everybody else is probably at home. Right. Uh, some of them, right. of course, out, uh, out on location in the street, but many, all their correspondents, instead of being in the studio, will be at home. So they bring in that 
a Zoom call into their live broadcast. And that's what we did last week. And we set up a, uh, a, a as it turned out, a very nice looking temporary studio in a client's building. They had a very nice room that was designed for an audience of 100 or so. Um, and we eh, turned that into a, a two person television studio. Of course, those two people are staying on either side of the screen, two meters apart, as per UK government guidelines. Um, and we fed the, the Zoom call into that. And it worked really well. I say it myself, they were, they were looking at the person they were speaking to, they were hearing them over a loudspeaker, and they could interact quite naturally with that, with that call, just like, uh, just like you would yeah, see. Yeah, well, well, you know, you know that uh, television production values will come into, the, into this platform eventually, you know, because uh, we're, we're, you know, I'm just an amateur kind of fumbling around, uh, which is kind of fun. You know, I don't have a boss telling me, oh, well, you didn't do this. No, it's not, you, you know, it was like, hey, let's do it. But you, if you want to see something very interesting, watch Jimmy Kimmel on uh, YouTube because he does his shows now from his home. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's bare production, but it is excellent. that He has live interviews with people in different parts of the world. And he has the bands that sing. Uh, we just watch that Jimmy Kimmel and Jimmy Fallon, uh, what what they do, and it's funny. Both shows, I really saw how much I needed humor. It was because I laughed when I saw those shows, and I said, "Man, this is stress relieving." <laughs> just laughing, you know. Yeah, you okay, too, right? Oh, you get you get to meet my my partner here. He's coming in. He's, he wants to be a neurosurgeon. Okay. And uh, yeah, you you guys will have to meet everybody. We kind of we kind of go through, and sometimes we introduce everyone, or sometimes we don't. You go um, on with the show, John. You you, you say hi to everybody. And okay. Yeah, I think we should bow out at this yeah. point. No, no, you, you, no, no. You're welcome to stay. We're, welcome we're, to we're stay. just taking up uh, gallery space. No, that's okay. The more, the merrier. That's okay. Go for it. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi, Chandra. Are you here? Yes. Uh, uh, oh, good morning. Good morning, John. Good How morning. are you today? Good, good, thanks. Very good. Yeah, yeah. could you please move the camera up a little bit? Because uh, we're just seeing, yeah, there we go. There we go, that's better. Ipe, are you there? I think I've checked in. Did see him briefly. Yeah. Let me just check. I'm here. John, I'm here. Okay, I. How you doing? Hello, Professor Chandra. Good evening. Good evening, good evening. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> another okay. another locked in day. Yeah, Mumbai is crazy, I heard. It is, it is. It's it's uh, virtually completely locked in. Uh, so few of us have to work, but not every day now. Yeah, my brother is also in Mumbai, so he's telling me how crazy it is. Yeah, the streets of Miami are empty. Empty. Yeah, the streets empty. are empty, and uh, uh, surprisingly, the peacocks and uh, various birds have come back into town, which we never saw <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, <wow. laughs> in a week's time. So, yeah, the pollution in China was clearing. Mm -hmm. Uh, they took pictures from NASA, and the, the, the smog had uh, totally disappeared for a while. Hey, Ricardo. Roberto. Roberto yeah. has an interesting background today. Oh, look, yeah, look, at that's a neurosurgical one. Uh, look, you see that, Chandra? He's operating. <laughs> yeah. where, where is that from, Roberto? What, what painting is that? Eh? What painting is that? Who, who painted that? Uh, Bosch. Actually, oh, Bosch Bosch's. in the Middle Ages, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. That's right. We did, we did talk about him. Here. Yeah, let me see what that. Uh, okay. He's uh, operating the stone of judgment. Okay. Okay. Uh, Greetings, everybody. Hello. Oh, we'll just we'll start in a sec.
Okay. Okay, Chandra, you ready? Yes. Um, okay, let me, let me give you a countdown. Let me just give you a countdown here. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning, it's Dr. John Bennett from Miami for Neurosurgical TV. Today we have another presentation by Dr. Chandra Dio Pujari, approaches to brainstem lesions. Uh, and let's uh, let Dr. Dio Pujari begin. Th welcome, Dr. Dio Pujari, and, and uh, thank you. Thanks, John, and thanks. I Yesterday, actually, when I was seeing Ives case, I wanted to just show a lateral approach. But then he uh, convinced me to talk about uh, uh, the whole approaches. So I have made it a little formal lecture, but we'll uh, see a few videos about uh, uh, some other approaches as well. Uh, is that projecting all right? Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So basically, I think uh, when we are looking at tackling the brainstem lesions, we are talking about four main approaches. Midline supracerebellar, cerebellar mainly for the midbrain lesion, fourth ventricular for the lesions from cervical medullary to uh, upper pons, uh, but mainly uh, lesions which are predominantly situated in the midline. Uh, then you have CP angle approach, and then you have the lateral supracerebellar approach, which is also very versatile and uh, uh, I have not used it much. Uh, uh, in my earlier cases, but I, becoming fond of this approach uh, more recently. And then you have exceptional cases where you have to use anterolateral and anterior approaches to the brainstem. I think uh, once we talk about the corridors of approach, then we uh, should also be talking about the various safe entry, entry zones in the supra and infra uh, facial triangles, supra and infra collicular triangles, and uh, these are the various landmarks which we see if we go through uh, the posterior approaches. I think one of the biggest uh, uh, advances which make it easier for you to plan today is uh, the DTI images. DTI images uh, show you uh, as to uh, where the tracts are displaced and which would be a safe corridor to approach uh, the lesion. Uh, I must say that uh, not all the lesions uh, within the brainstem are amenable for radical uh, surgery. And uh, if you look at the classification of various gliomas, it is mainly the focal gliomas which we will be talking about and not the diffuse spontane gliomas where uh, there is a controversy, should you even biopsy them or not. And of course, some other lesions, most notably cavernous angiomas, which is what you will see when we discuss the various approaches. And um, the other thing that has really come into uh, the uh, armamentarium of a surgeon to make sure that you can do this surgery safely is the brainstem mapping. You can actually map the seventh, sixth nerve nuclei. You can map uh, the tracts, the lower cranial nerves, and uh, it makes it much easier. Even during surgery, you can see if your evoked potentials are getting better or worse. And if you do not have it available, then of course, uh, as long as you are aware of the corridors and you uh, take general precautions, you can still be okay uh, for a focal lesion where you are not too aggressive to find uh, the margin of the lesion. Uh, so let us start about uh, the various approaches. This is a classically a midline approach, as you can see between the two tonsils. And I'm using a probe to see where is the uh, nucleus of the seventh nerve before I make a opening just lateral to that. Uh, so the fourth ventricular approaches can be mainly divided into midline infrafacial, uh, the forearm of Majendi uh, kind of approach. You just uh, the uh, spread the tonsils and you are usually there. This is a cavernous angioma presenting with sixth, seventh nerve paresis and ataxia. And uh, we've started surgery, a midline craniotomy first opening the forearm, of, uh, forearm and magnum, separating the tonsils. And then you can see, you can start seeing the obex and then you are going up. And I actually use, uh, this is this probe is a little, we didn't find a proper probe that day, but we uh, used first the ultrasound to localize. And then we have used this probe to localize where the uh, opening should be. 
and once we have avoided the sixth, seventh nerve nuclei, and we have localized the lesion, then we have gone ahead and uh, opened this, and the fresh clot is coming out first, as you can see. The main idea is not to put any kind of retractor. Usually the hematoma has dissected itself. And you will find that uh, the solid part of the cavernous uh, angioma has come out eventually. We are just trying to uh, see the motor evoke potentials and they are still uh, working well. And uh, uh, the seventh nerve seem to be working well. This is the immediate post-operative picture. And this guy uh, developed a mild facial paresis, but it improved in about uh, three months' time. Another lesion at the cervical medullary junction, and like uh, I was talking yesterday, it can be very tough sometimes to handle these lesions because you can get a sudden tachycardia or bradycardia uh, when you are operating near the ovex. But luckily, this lesion was surfacing. And uh, just you can see just below the ovex, and uh, as you know that the cavernous angioma uh, usually has a good kind of a uh, delineation from the surrounding uh, structures. And uh, you will find that it has been possible to gradually separate this and uh, remove this quite well. And though the guy had uh, to be filled with Riles tube for about uh, 10 days or so, Eventually, he walked out uh, without any tubes and uh, managed quite well. You can see the post-operative scan, and you can see that the whole cavernous angioma has been completely excised uh, without leaving any uh, major scarring around. What happens when you have a lesion which is slightly lateral, and you see this is an ideal lesion. This is a hemangioblastoma. The solid nodule is right. Uh, it is like paramedian just in the lateral corner of the fourth ventricle at the lower margin while the cyst is uh, going into the cerebellum along the pedicle, peduncle. And this is ideally situated for a telovelar approach like what uh, I showed yesterday. And I'll just show you the uh, way you, you just need to open the fora and magnum properly and get to the tumor. And once you get to the tumor, it allows you to, without too much retraction, it allows you to take the nodule out quite well. The whole nodule is being separated. And uh, then the cyst was, uh, cyst drained itself out. And uh, I think you have seen a very beautiful video yesterday. I wouldn't take too much time. The cyst took some time to resolve, but the solid portion of the hemangioblastoma was completely taken out. This is another patient, an eight year old boy who presented mainly with ataxia. You can see the tumor involving mainly the middle cerebellar peduncle. And again, you can see that the involvement of the brainstem is mainly on the lateral surfaces. And uh, uh, the tractography shows it much better. You have a very well denylated lesion. And uh, very likely, this is a pilocytic astrocytoma, like you said, uh, saw yesterday. And tractography gave us a clear idea that probably the best way to tackle it is to go from below and take it out again through the telovelar approach. So this is how it is being opened, the dura being opened from a midline incision. The tonsil is being raised. And you can start seeing the tumor quite well over here. I'm sorry. And once you have seen, and uh, you, you find that there is a uh, uh, no cranial nerve in your vision, then you take a biopsy, drain out the cystic portion of the tumor, and the pilocytic astrocytoma removal has started. The tumor is gradually debulked and then separated from the surrounding. Large chunks are being taken out for proper biopsy, and the tumor is separating itself now from the peduncle, as you can see. And yesterday, somebody was asking, how do you make sure that you do not get into the brainstem? Usually, you try to use a blunt kind of a dissection. You don't do a sharp dissection there. And only once you see the margin, like yesterday, I was saying you, you are creating planes 
within the tumor rather than between the brain stem and the tumor till till you have got a very thin capsule left and that's how this is being removed and uh, you can see further tumor is coming down and i always feel that we underestimate the tumor on imaging uh, when you are removing you you always wonder how so much tumor is coming out eventually the whole thing has come out the dura is being uh, sutured properly and this is the immediate post operative picture this case was done just about 2 months ago and i still don't have a post operative mri scan of this patient very very rarely you get a lesion which is stuck to the dorsal part of the midbrain and this was one such lesion more on one side and this was tackled by a supra cerebellar approach again i think during the meningioma case some of you who have seen the meningioma case done 3 days ago uh, i've showed uh, i think uh, that actually was uh, quite well this approach was shown very well here you have a, a fleshy tumor and this turned out to be a desmoplastic uh, uh, kind of a medulloblastoma which was stuck to the dorsal midbrain and could be removed completely uh and you can see all the veins uh, overlying there quite well now for the laterally situated lesions dorsal to the root entry zone of 7 to 9 the cp angle approach like what we usually do works very well this is a recurrent uh, cavernous angioma one of our colleagues removed this 3 uh, years before and the patient had one nodule left and it has grown further so this is another thing which you learn over a period of time that even cavernous angiomas though they are usually benign especially in the brain stem regions seems to bleed much more and you need to have a complete as complete a removal as possible so you can see that this is ideally situated to be taken out through the cp angle rather than going from here and uh, you can see a large exophytic component here and therefore it was much easier to decide that this is the best way to treat it you can see that uh, the medial wall has been uh, uh, first uh, we, we are trying to separate it from the medial wall first before going on to the cranial nerves further up it is being separated from the peduncle now and we had to remove it in pieces you you can see three or four lobules which were formed there it couldn't be all pulled out completely especially because it was a recurrent case and i was worried about the adhesions anteriorly to the cranial nerves and you can start seeing the seventh nerve complex lying just behind it now just behind and just above it and we are trying to remove this completely in front of that eventually we have to take a small cuff of cerebellum laterally to make sure that everything has come out and then layer surgery cell over right so little bit of cerebellar cuff to which this is attached usually you do not get such adherent uh, lesion when you are doing a primary surgery but in a recurrent surgery you may have to face such problems and this is a post operative scan which shows a complete this patient was grossly ataxic and uh, had difficulty in swallowing for about uh, a month month and a half but eventually recovered quite well and this is almost about 6 years now a more anteriorly situated lesion in fact in almost in front of the fifth nerve origin is more difficult to tackle and therefore uh, we actually recommend that we have to do something like a posterior petrosal or uh, in this particular patient the sigmoid sinus and the lateral sinus on the left side was pretty big and therefore we decided to go ahead with the standard retromastoid approach uh because that seemed to be the best approach on tractography 
you can see a dominant sinus on that side because of which I decided to use. And I usually use a supine, just head tilted approach and a small uh, question mark kind of incision. And you can see that the lesion is tackled uh, from here. So this is where we are opening into the CP angle. In fact, this was the case I thought I'll show you yesterday uh, when I offered to show a case. So you can start seeing that uh, that is the fifth nerve. Here is the seventh nerve. And you can see that uh, there is a little bit of staining over here. And uh, we make sure by uh, using navigation that we are getting to the area which has the uh, least amount of uh, brainstem you have to traverse and make starting making an opening with a curved uh, instrument uh, which we usually use to separate the uh, nerves from the tumor sheath uh, usually and as soon as i have uh, opened you can start seeing that the cystic part has started draining and the cyst opens up further and then you just keep on opening it. Do not try to use any kind of retractors till you find the proper uh, capsule of the cavernous uh, malformation. And that is being gradually uh, pulled out. And this is a problem with cystic cavernomas that uh, you do not get the same kind of satisfaction as you get in removing the other kinds of cavernomas, but here you can see that the capsule is eventually within my forceps and has started separating. And uh, once that is removed, you can start seeing a normal uh, kind of a gliotic uh, membrane. This is immediate post-operative scan. This patient was operated just about uh, six weeks ago. And you can see all the eye movements are intact and the patient has had a normal uh, uh, facial sensation and uh, uh, there was no uh, facial weakness either. So basically, you must understand the anatomy of the safe entry zones on the anterolateral surface and your best bet is to go between the fifth and seventh uh, root entry zone. I'll show you one more case where actually it was further up and we managed to do a pre-sigmoid uh, approach here. You can see that uh, after seeing the uh, uh, lateral uh, sinus, sigmoid sinus, we have taken a further one and a half centimeters of dura. And then I'm making an opening in front of the sigmoid sinus here. And uh, once I do that, you will find that unlike the previous case, you, you do not get into jumble of any nerves. You are right on the pons here and you can see the discolored pons right away where I'm making an incision with uh, we have started actually using cataract knife nowadays because they are available very cheaply they are always you find sterile packs and they are very very uh, low cost uh, one uh, they cost us about uh, one and a half dollars uh, for one uh, 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 knife. So it, it is, uh, I think, one of the things which you have started using very regularly now. So you are getting a, a blood clot out first and then once the opening gets dilated a little bit, you have started removing the cavernous angioma capsule. You can see that uh, most of the retractors which are being used, instrument suction as well as the retractor which is being used, are all malleable uh, instruments. And uh, uh, I think the Japanese uh, silver tipped instruments are very, very good to work in places like brainstem or uh, intramedullary lesions uh, to take them out completely. You can uh, use the dynamic retraction just to show that you have been able to take out the whole capsule quite well. And this is the immediate post-operative scan you can see uh, the opening which you have made, the mastoid air cells have been filled up with fat and you can see that the lesion has been completely taken off. If you have a lesion on dorsolateral brainstem surface, like this is a lesion which was straddling the midbrain and this was thought to be, this had bled twice and was operated as a cavernous angioma, a large lesion. And here we decided 
after seeing the tractography that the best corridor probably was along the tent. So we went uh, for a occipital uh, transtentorial approach here. You can see that uh, the junction of the fox at the uh, fox and the uh, tentorium is being opened. You are going along the junction, and then you start seeing the dorsal part of the brainstem here, and uh, you straight away get into the lesion here. You started getting some amount of blood clot, and then you decompress further and further, and this actually turned out to be a hemorrhagic tumor rather than a cavernous angioma. Uh, but uh, this this seems to be quite a good approach and gives you plenty of space. So this is another option for you. Now, if you have a lesion further anterior, uh, then you can actually approach these lesions either through Sylvian fissure or by uh, what is used commonly for basilar aneurysm, the temporopolar approach. Uh, so this is another boy, a six-year-old boy who presented with a pilocytic astrocytoma with a small bleed. This has actually been biopsied at another place. And uh, then I got this patient for a radical kind of a surgery when pilocytic astrocytoma was confirmed. So here we decided again after a tractography, you can see that the lesion is mainly in the one half and uh, uh, you have uh, the lesion surfacing on the anterior anterolateral aspects. Same you can see uh, that the tract are displaced in the same way. So I went uh, by a terional approach, drilling out the sphenoid ridge opening the dura like what you would uh, uh, do to go for a um, aneurysmal surgery mainly, opening the sylvian fissure uh, as well as possible so that uh, the frontal and temporal lobes are unlocked. This is where the whole middle cerebral artery is exposed. Now this is important because then you do not have to uh, use too much retraction down. I am now on lateral surface of the carotid artery so that I will get into the brainstem just lateral to the uh, third nerve. This patient had actually presented with third nerve paresis which was recovering. And here you can start seeing the staining of the hemorrhage. We have entered the brainstem over here without much uh, uh, without using any sharp instrument and the tumor has started coming out. And this tumor could be eventually removed quite well. There was a reasonable good place or, uh, plane of separation as you can see. <coughs> and this is the immediate post-operative scan. A very small remnant was left uh, which was then subjected to uh, radiation. Another lesion which was encroaching not only into the midbrain but also posterior thalamus. And here, the half and half approach uh, or the temporopolar approach, uh, uh, Dr. Sano, I have seen using this approach quite frequently for basilar aneurysm. So, you again take out the, uh, I mean, uh, some people will say that you must make sure that your venous drainage is properly studied and the temporopolar vein is not the most important vein for venous drainage. Once you make sure of that, you need to take out the temporal vein and then you need to take out about two centimeters of temporal lobe to get into the anterolateral part of the brainstem, which is what we did here. While doing that, we are, as the thalamus is also involved, you will see that the hemorrhagic fluid starts coming out as soon as we have taken this out and further tumor removal after this becomes much easier. It becomes like a surface lesion and uh, virtually the whole tumor could be taken out. The whole solid portion of the tumor could be taken out. And uh, uh, don't have too many very well focused shots, but you can see that the, virtually the whole thing could be removed completely and you'll find that only uh, some cystic element is seen uh, post-operatively, which is really uh, CSF. There is no enhancing nodule anymore. Extremely rarely, and we have two cases where we have had to do uh, midbrain lesions through the transcalosal approach. This is a patient, again, a cavernoma. While deciding what is the best way to go about it, uh, this patient re and the ventricles dilated a little bit. 
and as this was coming almost into the lateral ventricle i decided to go by uh, the transventricular approach transcalosal transventricular and you can again see that there is a bulge uh, with uh, uh, hemosiderin and uh, you can see that uh, we entered the cavernoma very easily and the whole lesion is coming out uh, after uh, the liquid part of the lesion was uh, drained out through suction it is uh, uh, it is separating itself out so well that one did not have to do too much dissection to take it out you have to be of course patient and uh, you cannot pull it very very hard but the lesion is presenting itself through the small opening created it's quite a large lesion at least two bleeds uh, which have been well documented and the whole thing has virtually come out uh, in one piece at the end of this and uh, once we saw the clear gliotic margin we stopped there and uh, you can see that the whole lesion has come out on the post operative scan with a good improvement in the patient when you have a lesion like this or a diffuse lesion should you be doing biopsy i think whenever there is a irregular enhancement like this or like this we have occasionally performed biopsies if the patient did not respond to anti tubercular treatment i am showing you this one example because the earlier patient i had to do a biopsy uh, while in this patient uh, we treated with anticox empirically and the lesion completely disappeared so whenever you have a lesion with a multi nodular kind of appearance and a large amount of edema in our part of the world i think that is one consideration you should have and of course uh, when you are not sure you can do biopsy you can do a good biopsy without a stereotactic uh, you can do with frame frameless machines nowadays fairly well especially the ones which take the tractography so that you can find a good corridor quite well sorry i uh, took a bit of time just to explain what are the various ways to approach the lesion but i hope uh, it has given a general overview of uh, uh, the topic thanks very good thank you chandra very much i do you want to lead the discussion yes uh, comments from i and some discussion please mm. okay do you want me to get you up the screen share uh, chandra yeah yeah I be there. Perhaps I stepped away. Um any comments or questions? Oh, there there's I there's I go ahead. Yeah, excellent presentation uh, Professor Chandra. Excellent. I mean uh, you've shown all the approaches to the uh to the to the brainstem. Excellent. So um, yeah, I mean what I was showing yesterday uh was just the posterior approach and you seen you shown all the approaches uh, from top bottom everything this has been a really comprehensive presentation so i'm sure the panelists uh, and the other guys will go through it and learn a lot um i think tomorrow i'll present a basilatic uh, aneurysm being clipped a uh, posterior pointing basilatic aneurysm being clipped uh, 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 anterior anterolateral unlocking and then uh, clipping it So, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Professor Chandra, for sharing your valuable experience. Okay, very good. Uh, any more comments or or questions of, of Chandra or I? Come on, now's your chance. <clears throat> thank you very much for this nice presentation. I want to ask you about when you. Uh, go and remove a cavernoma after the first bleed or the second bleed because there is a controversy and how you uh, how long you wait to remove after acute bleeding 
for six uh, both weeks. Both are excellent questions. I think uh, the definite indication to remove is more than one blade, or if there is a progressive neurological deficit, or if uh, uh, there is concordance with seizures in uh, supratentorial area. Uh, usually in brainstem, I would use another anatomical criteria. Is it surfacing in any surface of the brainstem uh, or ependymal surface on the ventricular side? If it is surfacing somewhere, then yes. I think I can probably do better than the natural history of the disease. Otherwise, the main consideration while operating on a cavernous angioma is that uh, you should not be harming the patient. You hardly ever get a fatal bleed. Uh, but I think there is a greater indication to operate on a brainstem cavernoma because uh, the Lancet has actually shown the, there are two studies now, the Japanese study and there is a multicenter study which has shown that uh, the brainstem cavernoma tend to bleed six to eight times more than other cavernous angiomas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. More questions, comments? I just wanted to ask, uh, Prof, uh, when you're doing the one of the cases, you are trying to remove the capsule. Yes. Uh, yeah. Is that is that a standard for you? You try to remove the capsule over time, or if you just check out the internal part of the of the cavernoma, that's enough. Excellent question again. I think uh, I would remove it with the capsule in the non-eloquent area. In the eloquent area, I would not particularly. Uh, go after it and I would not forcibly create a plane. But if I can get it out easily, I would like to remove this. I forgot to answer uh, the second part of the first uh, question, which was when do you actually operate after how many days of hemorrhage? My general idea is to wait somewhere between three to six weeks. Because in, if you operate in the immediate post bleed period, the surrounding brainstem is quite fragile and it you, you may cause more neurological deficit. I think it's about three weeks it is organizing and it becomes a little easier uh, for the clot to be removed well without causing much hurt to the brainstem. Okay, good. Okay, more comments, Thank questions? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now's your time. Hey, there seem to be quite a few people logged in, so I'm sure yeah. there are questions. Yeah, people are a little shy with this tech, uh, Chandra. I think once they get to know it and feel comfortable with it, it, it reminds me of like a surgical instrument. The first time you handle it. Yeah. Maybe I have confused them enough. Yeah. <laughs> so do you uh, usually remove the hemosiderin drink along the uh, cavernoma? Because uh, according to several of the studies, removing the hemosiderin ring will be very beneficial uh, in long term in the control of epilepsy. So what, what's your recommendation regarding the hemosiderin ring? So I think there is uh, enough, uh, uh, there is enough written about hemosiderin ring now for us to understand that yes, it plays an important role. I think most of the studies, what they have shown is that what is more important than the hemosiderin ring is the uh, how long the patient has had epilepsy. And general consensus today is that if anybody has had seizures for more than two years, you should probably be more radical and you should try to remove the hemosiderin ring. And if the seizures have been less than two years, then you are not so aggressive. This becomes important, especially uh, if you're operating in eloquent areas. Otherwise, any patient presenting with intractable seizures, I would like to remove the hemosiderin ring. Yeah, well, for me, I would, uh, uh, I would just use water uh, irrigation on the hemosiderin ring. I really, really, after I take the capsule out, I'm just going to be irrigating it a lot and usually the color changes with irrigation. A little bit of very mild curating and irrigation. irrigation. Uh, that would be enough for, I mean, and going after it, as Chandra said, uh, may not be uh, the greatest. So 
um, just irrigation. But the capsule is very important, of course. You don't take out the capsule and you have a recurrence. Uh, so you take out the capsule and then uh, we just irrigate, 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 and uh, the color usually changes. And, uh, that be okay. Yeah, I think that that can be an important uh, way to get rid of the hemosuterin. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. That, that's really awesome. Okay, so thank you so much for thoroughly uh, explaining this. Thank you. Welcome. Hey. Okay, any comments, more questions or comments from the panel? Well, uh, okay, Dr. Deepajari, thank you very much. And we look forward to your next one. Anytime. Thanks, an, an, I, anytime. I may not be able to join for two days, but then I'll join you again by Monday. Excellent. Sure. Excellent. Uh, let, let's just take the opportunity now to go around and meet everybody. Hello, Khalif. Could you please introduce, I know you asked a question, but introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Khalif from Kenya, I'm a Kenya resident, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Khalif. Noor, Noor? Hello, Hello, Noor. Hello sir. Hello, sir. How are you? So, uh, I'm Dr. Noor Hudamaria from Pakistan. I work at Rathri Research and in Punjab Institute of Neurosciences. Yeah, welcome, Noor. Uh, Dr. Haifaz, <laughs> Haifaz? Hafiz, I'm Dr. Hafiz, yes. six-year neurosurgical resident from Palestine. Very good, welcome. And thank my part, my partner, Simon Downs. Hello, Simon. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm in Chicago. I'm a medical student. Uh, thanks very much for allowing me to join. Okay, you're you're in the radiology suites there. Yes. <laughs> okay, um, uh, Roberto, are you there, Roberto Passati from Italy? Yes, I'm here. Basic medical doctor waiting to, to be a neurosurgeon in my life. Yeah, you have an interesting story, but that, that's Hieronymus Bosch in the background doing brain surgery. <laughs> right? Thanks. Yes, and, yes. Uh, th there he is. And maybe, yes, we'll get, so. maybe we'll Bob will, uh, maybe Robert will play the accordion at the end. <laughs> if we in front of Hieronymus Bosch, whoever thought. Hello, Zolo. Zolo, can hello you go everyone. ahead? Hello, everyone. Hello, Dr. John. Hello. Yes, hello, everyone. I'm Zolo Ivan. I'm a CTA medical student from Cameroon in Africa. It's a pleasure being here with you, and thank you very much for everything. Okay, and it helps us out also. Uh, Dr. Hansen, could you please introduce yourself? Go ahead. Yeah, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Hansen, a CTA medical student from Cameroon, Africa. I've had a great time being with you guys, and I've learned a lot. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Weil from Sudan, correct? Dr. Weil? Unmute yourself there. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Dr. Weil. I'm a surgeon from Sudan. Glad to be here. It was an excellent, exceptional talk. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, Dr. Shish, Dr. Sh uh, Ashish, please, could you introduce yourself? Can you hear me, Dr. Ashish? Am I saying your name correctly? Possibly not. Uh, let's see, Kartik Multani, are you there? Yeah. Hello, yeah. sir. Hello. Hello, sir. I'm Dr. Kartik from Hyderabad, India. I'm a final year neurosurgery resident here. Okay, welcome. This, yeah, this is an amazing platform, sir, for all of us to learn here. Well, you're, you're welcome. We have them every day. Thank you. Okay, Thank you're you welcome. Okay. Uh, Dr. Selek. Selek. Hi. Dr. Shalek from Bangladesh, consultant neurosurgery of Bangladesh Army. So it's, I was hearing Chand, uh, Chandrasekhar mm -hmm. Dipujari sir's lecture. It's good. Okay. So I have uh, one uh, query regarding his uh, experience uh, going from the top, some free point annihilation transcalosal transforaminal approaches, because I have the, the scope to some experience with uh, Charlie Tio to do some cases. So what is uh, his opinion regarding Dipujari? Uh, <laughs> uh, that's that's a bit too far for me. I I am not very. Uh, if you are talking about going into the prepontine space with the uh, endoscope, I think that is that is good for third ventricle ostomy, but not not for a tumor. I have never done that. Uh, I think uh, we can all follow Charlie. Maybe once he has shown us something, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. I, I have certainly uh, tried to remove tumors uh, from the top of the midbrain 
uh, through an endoscopic approach, especially uh, if you have a clearly well delineated tumor. Uh, yes. I have removed epidermoid from there, but I have not done a parenchymal tumor otherwise. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Alihu, are you there? Could you introduce yourself? Or Dr. Sabir Birkram? Yes, it's Dr. Alihu here. I'm a medical officer from Nigeria. Um, it's a pleasure to be among you all. Welcome. You're welcome. We have them every day. You're welcome. Uh, okay, anybody else that hasn't been introduced? That's one of the strong parts of this platform is meeting everybody. Okay, very good. Okay, I. Uh, what? Uh, what's the plan John, for tomorrow? What's the plan for tomorrow, right? Tomorrow, I'm going to do the basilar tip aneurysm, and uh, you know, Vlad has just uh, messaged me on neurosurgery coach. He he's got a series of 175 uh, suprasurebral arrhythmia one of the largest in the world. So, this guy is going to give a talk. And Juha also told me that Juha is uh, planning to give a talk on the Chinese version as well as on our version, English version of Neurosurgery Coach and Neurosurgical TV. So we're going to get a lot of, uh, Dr. Goyle called me up a few uh, days back and he is also willing to give a talk. Luis would be happy to give a talk. So we, we're going to get all these guys and uh, we're going to you know learn from their collective experience. Uh, Henry, as soon as he's a bit less busy, he is also uh, going to join in. So I have just proposed that the anatomy committee, WFNS anatomy committee, where I am there, and Imad, uh, Pablo, uh, Lado, all of these guys can uh, start giving talks. So we would uh, like. A little connection there, connection blip. The, wi the Wi-Fi may be a little crowded. Okay, Musindo, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, you haven't been introduced yet. Are you there, Musindo? I think we lost that yes, there. Hello. Yeah, hello, say hello. Everybody. Good afternoon, I'm Musindo, neurosurgical resident from Mozambique. Mozambique. Welcome. Yeah, he, he's the most frequent visitor, I think. <laughs> Welcome, Musindo. Uh, let's see, who else? Did I miss anybody? Uh, okay. Then we'll end this session and I thank you very much, Dr. Chutia Pujari, and we'll have this edited. So, thanks, uh, guys. Seems to have been a very exciting uh, uh, series of lectures ahead. And I would certainly join from time to time to uh, learn something as well as maybe contribute. Yeah, everyone likes, everyone likes to see you, Dr. Dia Pujari. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Okay. We, we stop recording now. So, uh, how are things in everyone's parts of the world? In Miami, like I said before, it's frozen. You look out in the street, you don't see anybody, the car, no traffic. Uh, the, what's it like in everyone else's part of the world? In, in Mumbai, it's, it's, it's the still the same? Uh, it's, it's hot and humid again. I mean, it's, it's still present. Mornings, evenings are still present. Yeah. But, uh, but the most important thing is everywhere you can see the emptiness. <laughs> well, people are taking this seriously. Wow. Yes, it's, yes. it's great. It's great they're taking it seriously. Uh, this week is supposed to be very crucial for us. So I think uh, people have taken it very seriously. Yeah, in Miami, I'm very surprised that no one is on the street. I'm surprised that people are complying. It's not illegal. You can still go outside, like to go to the store, but no one seems to be abusing it. The people are really listening. <laughs> Uh, which is great. Anybody else? Uh, how about the Khalif? How's it like in Kenya? Hello? It just goes to show that this kind of platform probably is more uh, going to be more robust over the uh, next few years rather than, you know, meeting yeah. <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, instead of traveling, this is much, much more better. And then uh, the clarity is very good. I think we can communicate with each other much better than uh, earlier. So I, I'm. We should must thank uh, uh, John to make it possible for all of us. Well, you know, you know, you know, you know, I Pachandra, uh, uh, it's been made much easier by unfortunately what's been happening. 
uh, with this with this uh, pandemic. And to show you how far it's gone, last night on TV, uh, a movie star, Samuel Jackson, you, you guys probably know who he is. Mm -hmm. uh, he said that he, when he wanted to get in contact one, with somebody, he says, I Zoom them. So it's becoming part of the culture here and it's become, and people seem to know what it is. Before it was a mystery what a video platform was, but Zoom had brought it into the common uh, knowledge, which I think is uh, gonna make it easier uh, to explain what's going on. So, yep. Let's see, Nor, Nor, where are you at? You're in Pakistan, right? Sir, there? I'm in Pakistan. Yes, yeah, sir, I'm here. I'm here. Yes, sir. How's, how's it there? How is it there? Sir, uh, here we're in Pakistan. We have got um, lockdown, although there is not, uh, you know, not a very strict curfew like lockdown, but it is, uh, um, uh, we are not allowed to go out uh, according to our one of the PPC 144 law. And two people, only two people can leave home. So uh, basically, I don't think that people are uh, quite compliant with that. Many people are still going out and having gatherings, etc. But still, uh, there is a lot of control in uh, in our area. We are usually staying at home in home isolation. In hospital, the policies have been changed and OPDs have been closed. We are only operating on emergent cases, such as um, the trauma cases, as well as some future triplexes and vascular accidents. If, if patients have got like unreasonable bleeding, in that case. Those patients are being admitted only, and no other case has been uh, um, had been operated or admitted so far. So uh, we can we can say that uh, yes, we do have a lockdown and we do have high power isolation right now in Pakistan. Uh, but things are just fine. Weather is very good, but it's very unfortunate. We cannot go out and uh, see <coughs> what's happening. All of the events have been cancelled in Pakistan, and um, uh, uh, we are not allowed to have any even any function. Even the wedding parties and other gatherings have been strictly prohibited in Pakistan right now. So yes, we do have a lot of uh, strict, uh, strict uh, restrictions by the government. But I think that people need to be uh, more aware of the consequences that may be if they do not follow the instructions. So I hope if people comply with the, the precautions, then maybe we have a better day. <laughs> we do have about 2,000 cases right now in Pakistan. Yeah, I'm surprised so many people are listening. <laughs> listening. I thought uh, not many people would listen at all. They were just going to do, do what they want. But people yeah. are taking this seriously. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Weil, how are things in Sudan? Dr. Weil, did you step away? Maybe he may have stepped away. Uh, did I get everybody? Roberto, how are things in Italy? Not so good, actually. Yeah. Is, uh, we have uh, more than uh, 12,000 dead people. We now, had, uh, what are the demographics of that? I'm sorry to interrupt you. What are the demographics of that, the, the, de the mortality? What per do you know the percentages, the ages, approximately? <coughs> have they done a breakdown of that? Something like 15% uh, of um, contagious uh, are, are be, became dead, died. So, sorry, so, sorry for my English. Yeah. I, uh, I was supposed to, to speak better, but it's a lot of time that I just speak. Uh, if you want, I can show you one thing. Uh, um, I can share you the screen and I show you. Can I? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Just a moment. Uh, okay. We're live on YouTube, but we're not recording. Okay. Can you see? Yes. This is actually the situation of Italy now. These are uh, contagious. These are dead people. Right. This is the difference between yesterday and today of dead people. So 800 more. Okay. Uh, and this is my personal. Uh, wait a moment. I made uh, this graph. I would like to. Uh, you uh, made wait. that graph? Yes, yes. I just uh, seen uh, send in uh, the numbers of the, the people and uh, wait. Uh, okay. This is the percentage of yesterday. Oh, okay. So is a uh, one. Uh, is is uh, one hundred is uh, more or less uh, almost twenty percent of uh, of all the entire people are dead. 
And oh, okay. So it, it pretty well adheres to what you hear, that approximately 20%. And, and these uh, are, are actually are going the, the, the death. Okay. The difference of the death of, oh, from okay. yesterday to today and so on. I think well, it's growing. Well, hopefully growing, it's growing, flattening growing. out. It seems to be flattening out, I guess. But it seems, it seems, but um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I guess just got to wait. Well, I don't know. You got the accordion handy, handy? You got the accordion handy? Ah, you, you want uh, to play? Yes, if you want to uh, yeah. play. Yeah, the, pa the panelists. Do you want to hear the, uh, Roberto yeah. play the uh, accordion? Why not? Yes, yes. <laughs> Why not? Yes, go ahead, Roberto. We <laughs> just, love it. Just, just give me one minute. Did, did you ever ahead. think you'd see someone playing the accordion in front of Hieronymus Bosch? <laughs> In a neurosurgical webinar. <laughs> Wait a moment. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, Simon. Hi. Hey, the dog. Yeah. I, I Khalif, yeah. meet Simon. Hello. Uh, he, he, we started off together with this, and he's in medical school Hi. now. Wow. He's Hello. in medical Hi. school now. I'm in Chicago. He's a, he's a nice neurosurgery. Visit. He's got oh, the bug. He's got the bug. Yes. It's uh, we're in lockdown here, so I'm taking the time to write a paper and uh, get out a couple of times a, a day and uh, study. And they're actually going to offer a few classes online. We do pathology and radiology, so just to try and make up for the time. But uh, yeah, yeah, the, it's great to meet everybody. Yeah, dog, dog was the guy that that convinced me to go from Google Hangouts to Zoom. That's right. A couple of years ago, he says, "John, you got to check out this program, man. It's good." Uh, dear, uh, dear May, this is Simon. I like to meet Simon Downs. He he starred with me when we started. Oh, meet you. So he, yes, he uh, yeah, dear May's in the in the business of, of conferences. Uh, but is it? Oh, when still, you want that? Yeah. When you want. Oh, okay, okay. We're ready. Oh, dear May, dear May, we'll talk to you later. We have some entertainment, and dear May, dear, a, you don't have to pay for it. <laughs> this is a typical room from France. Okay. From France. Okay, it's all yours. And can you pin him? In video? Uh, I'm sorry. That's right. When's the last time you saw an accordion in front of uh, the Bosch? <laughs> right. I'm not so good as accordionist. I'm not so good as neurosurgeon. I'm not so good as dentist. I'm not so good anyway. That's all right. Okay. That's all right. We'll, we'll get better. We'll Just get study. Better. Yeah. Okay. Is there any? Let's see. Uh, Dr. Uh, Naya Go. Uh, do you want to? Hello. Let's see, there's a couple of docs I have we haven't really talked to yet. Uh, Dr. Ni, is he Dr. Alihu? Alihu? Well, yeah, Alihu. Oh, okay, Alihu. there you are. That, that's right, we did meet you before. <laughs> now, how, yeah. how, are you, how are you doing and how are things in your part of the world with the corona? Oh, well, um, I'm from Nigeria. Well, so. Right now, some cities are on lockdown. We just have a few cases, like about 170 something, not quite okay. sure exactly. Just two reported deaths. Okay. Um, maybe because we're not testing a lot. Uh, people are taking the lockdown a bit serious, I would say. The, the awareness is there. Um, yeah. I'm a bit surprised because initially Nigerians were like, nah. Like they didn't believe it. Like it was like, uh, what is coronavirus? People were making jokes, but yeah, I mean, watching the CNN and all those uh, international news agencies, they get to realize how serious it was. Like seeing developed countries, how yeah. they are going through. Like we're like, wow, we don't even have the healthcare system, so we just have to, you know, take care of ourselves. 
we're really practicing the social distancing thing, but it's a bit hard in our part of the country. Even the lockdown is hard because there are people that survive by just going out that day, they get food for themselves and their extended family. So it's quite complicated locking down some places. People in mean, the government hasn't provided like relief. They didn't really plan it out properly, but I do from the scientific part of it, understand the purpose of the lockdown, you know, mm-hmm. to prevent the spread. But in yeah, our settings, there's so many other factors. But all in all, I think we're doing okay. We just need more testing. That's it. Yeah, I mentioned yesterday, the president of Burundi, they have zero cases. And they asked him, what's the secret for you not? He says, we don't test. <laughs> that, that, that's a good way to get a zero. But you know, one thing I, I think uh, that uh, made a lot of people take it seriously is seeing some p- famous people die, uh, unfortunately. And it seems that these people weren't in bad yeah. health. Uh, some of the neurosurgeons that died, I was surprised that they, they, they weren't young, but they seemed rigorous. And anybody that's a neurosurgeon is tough, strong, physically. Uh, so I think it would take something to, to knock these guys out. Yes, hi, Dr. Sundar. Where are you from? Where are you from, Dr. Sundar? Okay, I don't understand you. Does anybody understand what Dr. Sundar is saying? Oh, I can't, can't hear what you're saying. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, initially, DMA, the, um, and we'll just, initially, uh, we started doing these private, Simon and I started doing these private uh, uh, webcasts with, in neurosurgery mostly. Uh, but then once we met the people, because uh, this is a great way to network within the medical community, you get to meet people, even though, like you say, you know, I'm sure he's a big neurosurgeon, John Bennett, what, no, no name. But if you do the technology, you get to know him. And so once you know uh, people in the upper levels of a specialty, I think, they introduce you to their friends. And most of their friends are t- tops in, in the field, and that they're, they're ones that uh, do conferences. And so then they start asking you to do conferences. Do you know what I'm saying, dear maid? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. that's how we got into the neurosurgery community. It's like and a family, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure, all these top guys, they, the the friends all run the conferences. I mean, and probably in most industries. Yeah. And so and so once you get those conference go, uh, people put, that, and you televise those, then you meet more people in that particular industry uh, that will, you know, refer you and, and get you more entrenched into the community. Yeah. But are you, are you involved in that? Do they just they call you to to uh, have you televise an event or do you actually go out there and uh, and, and get try to get clients? Oh yeah, we, we do both, John. But um, to give other people a, a little background, um, we would film medical conferences all over the world. Um, for example, we did a, a spinal surgery conference in the Royal College of Surgeons in London. And same thing, you have four or 500 surgeons coming together and we're beaming it out to the world. Um, but what actually got me interested in John's work was uh, my father actually died of a glioblastoma. And okay. um, I uh, I always thought I'd... I'd, I'd if any way I could help you, John, I would always reach out and, and, and you know, help that way. So um, I think it's spectacular what you're doing because you're, 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 you're bringing people in from all over the world and you're showing the cases. And the, I watched the lecture at the start and, you know, your doctor from India was sharing his, his workings on lesions and stuff like that. So uh, it's amazing. Well, I, um, uh, you mentioned uh, the, the uses of this platform. Um, you can get people from artificial intelligence to interact with neurosurgeons 
Uh, matter of fact, a lot of work is being done in China in artificial intelligence and, and neurosurgery. Uh, and, yeah. and this allows us to explore that interface, you know, without going to China, uh, with just yeah. putting, putting people together, at least, to, uh, to start the, yeah. the, 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 the discussion. And, do, and do you guys uh, use that, John? I, I, I can see Simon. I see you've got a, a brilliant background there. Yeah, um, see, Simon is good with the tech. He, he yeah, it tech. looks great. But I, it's a good question from from an AI perspective. How is that affecting the industry, and do you see it coming into play? Yes, yes, yes. Well, well, I kind of let the journal services, services judge for themselves, but they seem to feel because I don't get involved with too too much what's going on. I know a little bit about it. Yeah. Uh, cause I really like you, I don't have the time to really get into other things. Um, but from what I've seen, they re seem to respect the science of artificial intelligence in areas like glioblastoma multiform. There's a lot of research in China, uh, because clinical trials there are a lot easier to do than in America and Europe. It takes a long time. Uh, but in, in China, there's no, apparently there's no shortage of volunteers uh, and and drug trials move much quicker. Uh, and in areas like uh, glioblastoma multiform, where as you know, not much progress has been done. Uh, and, and there's been a lot of research, uh, but that's one area where uh, in China, especially they hope to make some progress in, in, in that particular type of treatment. Uh, and and the, the science, how, how that would attack glio Glastoma multiform. I imagine it comes down to analysis of facts, uh, basically, because I think that's what artificial intelligence is. It kind of analyzes facts from diverse areas. Um, it, and, it, can, uh, it can learn, John. So the scans of brain images and stuff, you can, you can send thousands or millions of images onto a, an algorithm, which will basically hone in and find you know, in your world, what, you know, things that are, shouldn't be there. Um, and it can go a step forward and then start to learn if that's a problem, then this might be another problem. And, and um, my background is in coding and in, and in the tech side of things. So we would do conferences with Google engineers and stuff like that. And um, I seen a great study they were doing on retinal images. So they were taking an image of, um, it was in India. And from the image, they could do a scan of your eye and they could show you how likely you are to have a heart attack, you know. Really? Yeah, so because... Eye kind of scan. Oh. Well, retinal scan, so they're looking at the capillaries and, you know, what's going on there, but they're actually referencing thousands and thousands and millions of images that have been done before. And they've highlighted that, you know, these are the patients that have the issue. And then and then the, the AI is just merging that. You know, they're merging the... And, and, and flagging it up. Um, yeah. Now I can't see you guys being put out of business, but I can sure it's a good. I'm sure it's a good tool. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course they want to analyze the, the, the millions of scans that have been done in, in, my, in glioblastoma multiform. Uh, and, and and we we interviewed actually a, a Chinese head of a Chinese artificial intelligence company that analyzes chest X-rays in Beijing. Because Beijing is is so is apparently very polluted, and there's a there's so many uh, pulmonary problems, but they don't have, doctors don't have to even time to read the chest X-rays. So this company reads them by by artificial intelligence, and it's actually more accurate than the doctors. Uh, I think it's pretty close uh, accuracy, like 92, 93 uh, percent mistake rate, whatever. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it's being done now in Beijing. Yeah. Artificial intelligence is reading chest X-ray. Uh, yeah. So because it's just short shorthanded uh, to read something that's I guess really common. Yeah, it's amazing. That is amazing. Um, from a from a surgery perspective, um, I see a lot of uh, robotics coming into play. Is that is that coming into neurosurgery these days or? Yeah, again, I, I kind of have to trust the neurosurgeon's judgment. They seem to be very interested in it. And matter of mm -hmm. fact, we had a neurosurgeon from Canada. Um, I forget, uh, General Garner, Garner Sutherland. He's a friend of, uh, he, he does robotics. He actually worked with NASA 
and, uh, and, and that's where uh, the big time funding comes for, for robotics. That's how they developed the artificial arm because that was NASA and that was the military of the US because they wanted to actually build, I guess, they're eventually gonna build a soldier that's you know a robot. So they built in the arm uh, and Garnett worked with NASA and he works with robotics in uh, neurosurgery. And again, we wanna get Garnett to come to a platform like this to give his input on uh, where he sees maybe robotics going. And, uh, yeah, yeah you, be, you could you could do a future of neuro neurosurgery session, John. Yeah, you know, no, this five is, ten years out from now, how do you think the industry will, will look? Well, that that well, part of our job really is mixing ingredients together. Uh, like we were, you know, I'm trying to put the doctors together in different in different fields. I think that's when it'll, it'll be really creative and fun for us, for for well, people like me and Simon. We put people together. Uh, yeah. And we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but it's good for them to be in the same room, just to hang out and chat, whatever, run some run some ideas by uh, by each other. So uh, that, that that's actually in the beginning of this platform, there was a something called Google Glass, which I'm sure you're aware of. Remember Google Glass? Right. Yeah. That was a that that was a big big fad, and I was a believer, and I thought it was going to take over medicine. And everything, and uh, some people actually did wear it for a while, but yeah. for whatever reason, uh, it, it didn't. But but we we had a conference where we tried to put neurosurgeons together with neurosurgeons that use Google Glass. There was a, a neurosurgeon in Philadelphia that was a big believer in it, using it in the OR. Uh, but there were so many problems with them. Um, security and privacy in the United States with that, that kind of device in the hospital. Uh, it's a very litigious atmosphere. People's, a lot of people sue each other over here. And if you put the wrong image on, uh, you know, I, I get requests, Simon, from people. The only people I get requests to change videos are usually Western people, either American or European, that'll say, hey, you put there was an image in the video I showed uh, in the at 148 42. Please take it out. <laughs> the, rest me, John, world, John. the rest of the world, they don't care. Yeah, John. Yeah, I, I, I have to go, so I have to go to control the me the homework of my children. So, okay. see you tomorrow. Okay, and goodbye, nice and see goodbye you. to everyone. Eh? Okay, thank, thank you for the entertainment. Thank you, thank you a lot. <laughs> I, I prepare a new piece of Goodbye. Okay. Bye -bye. Goodbye. Uh, I should go. Yeah, what do you think of that, Darman? You, you don't even have to pay for that. This is a free. <laughs> <laughs> very good, John. Very, very good. Well, the hell, show Jimmy Kimmel's on. doing it. Why, Why not? not? Why not? Is right. It's good for the spirit. <laughs> oh man, I, when I, I laughed yesterday when I I saw I watched Jimmy Kimmel, and he was making like fun things but not in a bad way of corona and the way people are doing and of course he had president trump saying all these crazy shit on tv saying what a great job he did he did a montage of him saying what a great job he's doing it went on for two minutes i did a great job again from different news conferences and it was funny i had to just laugh and it was good to laugh because these are kind of tension times you know yeah yeah you're too right you're too right it's good to see it yeah yeah. So, so yeah, the conferences are, co are coming uh, pretty frequently now. What What are you working on now? Is there anything in particular you're working on now? Um, we We were doing a climate assembly conference. Um, we do. Um, yeah, the medical stuff is 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 our, our best work, to be honest. Um, but okay. we also do things like um, garden design. We do okay. conferences in garden design. Yeah, is, Dave does yeah. Uh, ho horse shows. You know that, yeah, right, Dave? That's right, Dave Doherty, horse tech. And, yeah, and that yeah. is a fascinating world when you look at the technology that is on the cusp of coming into the human world, but is, you know, you can test it out on the animal. And, and the, yeah, the it's a whole world, new so world, man. It's whole world of genetics and breeding, and they're getting really technical yeah. with that now. Yeah, that is, and that's a great show David runs too. Um, so it's the future of, of our worlds colliding, the, the medical world and the, the IT world and, you know, the... 
<laughs> we're trying to get some IT guys in. There's an IT mm. guy that worked on the HoloLens. Uh, we're yes. trying to get him uh, to come into a conference with a neurosurgeon. Uh, but, well, that'd um, be superb. Yeah. 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 Um, the VR world, I'm sure you've, that's, I guess, HoloLens VR, that type of thing, the augmented reality world, you know, um, there is a lot of, the you mentioned the Google Glass, that was an early adopter type issues, you know, with connections and stuff like that. But, you know, as, as time progresses, IT does come up with um, some amazing devices. So five, 10 years from now, you know, Google Glass will probably be, be back, John. Yeah, well, I guess there's some other companies that are developing some type of, mm -hmm. of like it's Google Glass similar thing. Yeah. I guess we'll see what pans out. Uh, yeah. uh, but there was one company in California, all the doctors were using it in their office. There were like six doctors. Uh, and that was years ago. I, I, I want to I, I check back to see if they're still using it. It must be hard to get parts. Yeah. <laughs> it's like having yeah. a car, that, you know, they don't make parts anymore. So if a neurosurgeon is training these days, like how do they train? Um, it's a long training. Uh, it's every country is different. Uh, I know, I think in the US it's like a, uh, they generally do I think a year of surgery internship uh, or they, um, they may go directly into neurosurgery first year with maybe a heavy flavor on general surgery the first year. And then the second year, I think it's generally straight neurosurgery. Right for three or four years, depending on the country. I think Russia's, dog, I think Russia's uh, three years neurosurgery. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, uh, well, now you got your CNN background. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, uh, uh, yeah, I think Russia's a three-year residency in neurosurgery. Um, but Very mostly good. I think it's around five or six. And, and where are you based, Simon? I'm in Chicago at the moment. I was in Japan for 30 years. Uh, that's where I started medical school. And then uh, um, I, uh, I was, uh, this is my third career. Uh, I went to law school first, then I was a psychologist, uh, clinical psychologist, and then I went back to medical school uh, in my 40s. And uh, so I'm just finishing up now. But I'm in Chicago now, and uh, I'm just training in the local hospitals here and considering my specialty after. But I'm, I'm from England, actually. So I'm from oh, Coventry good. and lived in Surrey and Sussex. And um, my dad's in Devon. Okay. Wow. That's fascinating. They, yeah. they always say it's good to change your career. So Yeah, you know, it's I, very good. It's I had a teacher, uh, teacher yeah. of mine who says you should do it every seven years. Yeah. You know, well, I was so. a professor for about that long and, and in university, and I, I enjoyed it. But I thought, okay, what's next? Yeah, and Simon's entertaining going into neurosurgery. Yes, yes. Wow. And uh, wow. I don't. I'd like. I like to see that uh, the the doctors here who are operating into their sixties, seventies, you know, and uh, maybe sometimes late, sometimes taking lighter work, but continuing to work. That's what I'd like to do. So, not, yeah. you know, regardless well, of capacity. You know, dear my dear me, the 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 dedication that you see in neurosurgeons, mm -hmm. it's amazing. It's, mm -hmm. it's yeah, like once you're around them, uh, they love to operate. Most every neurosurgeon I've met, they just love to operate, just love it. I mean, it's like, oh man, uh, and uh, and that makes it worth it because they have lo longer hours than most doctors. Most, I think, of all the doctors, they work the hardest of all. I, I would say. What do you think, Ali? Ali, you, you're a student, but the neurosurgeons. Uh, I, I can remember training with them. They they had more call. You know what call means, right? When you have to stay at the hospital. Some, hosp some programs, every other night, dogs are on call for five years. Imagine that. <coughs> and some of, those place, some of those places, they don't get much sleep on that night. <laughs> so, and they have families. Yeah, yeah, families, married, maybe children, uh, and they have to work that horrendous schedule too. Uh, dedication is the only thing that does it. They're just totally dedicated. And the passion of the operating drives them. <coughs> That's what, what I see anyways. Yeah, I'm not a neurosurgeon yet, even though I'm an aspiring neurosurgeon. I, right from med school, it's been my target. Oh, okay. I was in the clinic. 
like uh, I studied medical medicine in the Caribbean before coming back home in Nigeria. Well, I had to do my internship and I'm a medical officer. We perform basic surgeries. Like where I am, it's more of like a district area, no neurosurgeon, okay. no neurosurgeon. Okay, so that, just the whole area, huh? do, do they yeah. go to the city do, are they, or the general surgeon takes care of the problem? Um, we medical officers and general surgeons just for neurosurgical cases, which like 80 to 90 percent are like traumatic brain injuries from road traffic accidents or assaults. We basically just stabilize before we refer to a, a tertiary institution. Okay, ready. you ship by ambulance or something? Yeah, ambulance for those that I can afford. And to be honest, there are many people that just like, see, we don't have money, we can't do anything, do the best we can. Right. The patient dies, it's the God. Like right. some leave it to faith. <laughs> we understand that. <coughs> we understand yeah. that. It's uh, yeah. it just it just happens. Yeah. But uh, you know, I'm not sure the mortality rate would be that much uh, lower if you, you know. Sometimes is there's not much you can do. Sometimes, but exactly. But exactly. Uh, anyways, uh, uh, what now? You want you're not in the main city of Nigeria, right? Are you? Yeah, in the main? where I was working is not is like in a district area. Like, uh, but right now I'm in Abuja, the capital. I just recently moved. Uh, but uh, where I was working, no neurosurgeon at all, and all those things. I still want to do neurosurgery residency, and well, you come back. You come back here, like like Simon. You're gonna meet neurosurgeons from all over the world. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a good. Well, it's a good way. It's a. It's a. Yeah, it's a know, good way because your career, people, your career is starting. Yeah. Your, your, your career is starting now. To meet right. and and you can meet people that will help your career. What happens now, is now, when you go to a conference, a live conference. And you see the same yeah. people that you met uh, online, and they recognize you. Right. Yeah, Simon, tell them the story about Japan. Well, I went to a conference in Japan, and before that, I had met uh, neurosurgeons from England uh, and the States and Japan, and then I saw them in, um, uh, in the conference in Japan. And you find yourself sitting next to you know professors from the universities and just chatting casually, because within that context, they're relaxed and uh they're sort of away from their their jobs so but you can make connections uh and right. it's a very good way to network uh you get introduced as you know in life to be introduced is a is a really you know, important thing more than test scores uh, more than where you went to school things like yeah. that it's like uh, knowing people and you can help them out in small ways i've, I've personally met i've met neurosurgeons uh like on social media especially twitter and some conferences that like uh, like the Co Continental Association of All African Neurosurgeons Conference happening in Abuja, I was able to meet like Professor Gay Rosio. I see. Like some top, top neurosurgeons that I mm. have contact with. And uh, while in medical school, uh, we created groups of students interested in surgery, like students, uh, global surgery group. So I was I part of like the neurosurgery group where we do research and advocacy projects related to neurosurgery. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I was also part of the team that, uh, I don't know if you know about the neurosurgery workforce mapping and the uh, data by WFNS, where one of the medical students that were actually calling countries to find out how many neurosurgeons they have. All this I was doing well in medical wow. school, just you know to get publications, to collaborate in research projects and, and all that. I've been involved in neurosurgical advocacy projects, especially in social media. Like my Twitter page, I handle many, many other organizations' page. Is there a Those dandy walker thing organization? That, mm -hmm. Sorry? Is there a dandy walker? Uh, yeah, not, I'm a member of dandy walker, mm -hmm. but also in session. Dandy walker, I've not really seen much activities and coming back from Nigeria, I've lost like touch with some of uh, the activities with the Dandy Walker uh, organization. But Incision is one organization and the Global Neurosurgery Initiative and the Harvard Program for Global Surgery and Social Change. Mm -hmm. I help out with data collection and, and uh, 
also data analysis for some of their projects. If they need information regarding neurosurgery in Nigeria, I'm one mm. of their major contacts. How many neurosurgeons are there in Nigeria? Um, I actually act recently at the World Congress of Nigerian Conference, say like 87, mm. 87 or 88 neurosurgeons. And, and how many million? How big is the country? Over like almost 20 million, 20 oh, million wow. of population. Wow. So there's so a, one, there's neurosurgeon, a new... one neurosurgeon for every, uh, wow, 250,000 wow. people. Mm-hmm. Like my well, state, here, here, United States, where, family, place... where 5 million people, there's no neurosurgeon. 5 million people in my state, no neurosurgeon. Here's a presentation that was done by a Nigerian uh, neurosurgeon. We have a, a the first in the African Neurosurgery Grand Rounds. Uh, we have the pleasure of having Abdullah I mean, know the neurosurgeon from Nigeria, uh, and yeah. we're going you know to. I'm going, could you please introduce yourself, Dr. Jamo? Do you know Dr. Jamo? Yes. yes, I am Zulu Ivan. I am a hello. I'm yeah, Zulu Ivan. It. I'm a me. So that's how that's how you meet neurosurgeons, right? Uh, and you it's meet you meet the, you meet them face to face, and uh, which is which is which is uh, better than a uh, a. Uh, you know, like an email. Right, right. So I'm trying to get off That's this. I, I can never get off. Okay. That's powerful, John. Very good. Yes. Yes. It's, uh, you know, DMR networking in the medical community, you know, because basically a lot of these neurosurgeons, you know, they're looking to move to another country or, or you know, they want to do a fellowship of a couple of months. And, right. uh, and it's a good way to meet people that way. Because most neurosurgeons, they, they train all over the world. I mean, they, they have one country generally, but sometimes yeah. they go to Japan and Germany and Italy. Whatever, and they do, depending upon what they go into in neurosurgery, they uh, go to different parts of the world. Because like, I guess France is a big vascular place, Japan. What, what, Japan is mostly vascular, right, Simon? They got a lot, really good vascular. Oh, I don't know. Is that what they're noted for? Do you know? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think they're noted for something. I think it's vascular uh, that most neurosurgeons die to do a couple of months training there. Isn't that what Samer go for? Did he go for uh, just to meet Dr. Cato? Yeah, that was yeah, a vascular endoscopic, endoscopic for three months. Yeah. No. Oh, okay. Endoscopic. Yeah. Neurosurgery. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Very good. You know, we've been done. We, we're doing a, a conference from Europe with you, some European European student think tank. We're doing a couple of online webinars, mostly on Corona. I think we have one tomorrow. I'm not sure, but uh, uh, yeah, you guys are welcome to come to any event we have, dear mate. But uh, how many people but, have you ever got got on this at once, John? What's the well? You know, uh, I think. 40, 40. Very good. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, it's funny. Uh, we're making progress. I mean, this is, this was good today, but, but he is, the, the guy that gave the talk, he's famous. Yeah. He, I mean, people know, I mean, that guy is well known as a, in his area of medicine, uh, which is endoscopy. But he's done fellowships in Germany, Japan, the United States. I mean, he's trained in many places. Uh, and he's a, an older guy. He's and he likes this type of technology. Uh, he he's a he's a perfect guy that I would love if he became a part of what we're doing because he's got a wealth of knowledge. He's got a big name, and he loves to teach. Uh, he likes the platform. He's I, I can see he's liking it. He's asking to do more uh, and stuff. Oh, well, you know how it is. You can kind of tell when someone likes something. You know they. They like the tech and stuff, but um, but anyway, I, I would find John. A people, a lot of people would dip in and dip out. Just time schedules are different, time zones are different. But I'm sure your your YouTube channel is is gaining traction. And yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I guess uh, you know people join. I don't even know. We got seven, almost seven thousand people now. Wow. Which, well, but that's not too impressive. But it shows at least yeah, we're getting in. We're getting in there. We're getting in there. You're a highly specialized field here, John. So I, I, yeah. I think it's amazing. Like to, yeah. give an ex- to give you an example, when my father was a patient, there was 12 neurosurgeons in the whole of Ireland. Wow. You know, 
So let's give well, you an idea. Yeah. Wow. That, that is, uh, how many million is Ireland? A couple, yeah, 10 million? 4.8, 4.5, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, 6 million. Four, how many, 14? 12, 12, and there was. God, and there, there, less there, than one per million? One, no, that's less than that, at my arithmetic. One so that, was, that was, what, 11 years ago, 12 years ago? Wow. Wow. And, you know, Africa, they have, uh, yeah, like eight for eight million people in the Congo. Congo and uh, they're, they're, wow, uh, they're spread thin. And I think uh, China may be the only country that can kind of feed their demand if somehow they can make it financially attractive to go there. Because, you know, sometimes I know when you're training, sometimes you go to hospitals that are bad, but they give you a lot of work. In surgery, they say they give you the knife. In other words, rather than assisting and showing and, and learning, so you, you do it yourself. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's how doctors learn sometimes. You, you get into a hospital that's, that needs someone so bad that they'll let you operate. And, and get experience. So, so, so some, I, I think some doctors might like going to places like, like uh, Japan, uh, like uh, Africa. And you know, I, well, I had someone that came to me from New Zealand. You could imagine, you, you, you would think there's no shortage in New Zealand for neurosurgeons, but this one area of, neuro, of New Zealand, they couldn't get a neurosurgeon. And they were, they were trying, that's, uh, they, they, they put an ad in, and I saw it immediately, and I posted it on the website, and man, I had so many people say, oh, I want to go there, I want to go there, because <laughs> New Zealand is supposed to be awesome, you know, but uh, anyways, uh, yeah, do you have a, dear man, you have a website, right, of, of what your company does, is it, is it your company, or is it, uh, you're yeah, working for it's myself and Richard. You met Richard earlier. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Richard it's, Jolly. That's it, yeah. So Richard's a BBC film producer, and he's 36, 40 years experience in the BBC world. Oh, wow. You know, well, so he, well, he, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, well, you know, you know, uh, I met someone, and I don't know if Simon remembers, on Google Hangouts, there was a TV person. Remember that dog, that attractive blonde-haired woman? Uh, I, I, I forget her name. Jones, I think. Anyways, she was she had her background in television, and she loved this media. I mean, she loved it, and and she couldn't believe that television people didn't know about it. Uh, mm -hmm. And he, she was like, "I'm I'm stunned by how come there's no the TV people, but um, but she seemed to be doing the same thing. She hasn't really done much uh, of anything." Uh, yeah, I, you you see a lot of talk shows now. They are pulling in Skype and Zoom. And uh, there's a good friend of ours, she works in London and she was doing her live TV broadcast from her garden, you know, because of Corona. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think when we, when we, when, when this passes, the world's going to be a very different place, John. And yeah. even in, in conferences and training and events, you know, you're going to see a lot more of this. Yeah, I think, you know, now, now that the more we're kind of in this thing, the, the mm -hmm. more um, it's going to be a financial catastrophe for a lot of people. A lot of people, I mean, a lot of people are going to lose money, uh, big money. And who can afford to go to a conference? I mean, if you have it, fine, no problem. But, but um, in that way, not having money may affect it too. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've noticed, but if you ever go on Amazon these days to try and buy a webcam or buy a piece of equipment, um, it's all sold out. Oh, really? Yeah. No, I haven't yeah. noticed that. Yeah, I've had clients. I've, I've invited them to do Zoom webinars and stuff like that, and I've pointed them to good cameras for their for the for the production, and they're gone. There's like a lead time of four months to get the kit. Once. Well, you know, you know, dear, let me raise this point, Simon, before you you go on. Is that that maybe you could? Uh, uh, I feel that that. Uh, of course, a revenue source can be done, which some conferences are doing, by the by the by the uh, basically televising on the internet. Besides having the conference, I mean, you televise the internet and you charge. You, you know that's done, right? All the time now, right? It is, yeah, yeah. yeah We've got yeah. clients that do that, yeah. Yeah, it's it hasn't happened big time in medicine yet, but it's on the way. 
it's on the way. Uh, uh, because myself, I we can't do that because you know it's, it's inconsistent in you know, production and stuff. But we're getting better. Uh, so the client would look at some of uh, my past work and I would say, well, you know, I don't know, those guys aren't there yet. <laughs> They're working mm -hmm. from their garage. Uh, but I think we're getting better. So what I would like, if you if you uh, have clients that want to explore that of us televising uh, a, a medical thing and that we try to charge for it, if they want to try that, uh, we might be able to do that. Yeah, no, it does happen, John. Um, um, you, it, it does take money to put on shows like this and to get people to a venue and to you know put on a conference. So people are happy to pay for it when they know they're getting value out of it. That's what yeah. I find. Yeah. Um, the other thing is people, um, time away from the office is a valuable commodity. Uh, travel time hotel costs, flight costs, all that, that all adds up. And if you can quick, you know, say to them, right, we've got the best professor in, in neurosurgery from Japan speaking live, um, you know, there's no reason why you, you can't put a small fee to that. Oh yeah, yeah, the, uh, and let me show you why, it's just not neurosurgery. Cause I wanna, you know, I wanna go with this in a, in a, in a big way, not with money, but with hopefully strategic positioning hopefully uh and this time in history i didn't expect to happen but it is because mm -hmm. uh, we have a website that covers medicine uh and okay the, the domain name is pretty good but we have studios in in all those specialties right yep. so th they're built uh, and i'm essentially going to change the, uh, this is like cardiology, and each studio is, is, is different. Uh, but um, uh, we want to, I'm going to basically, from, from now, I'm looking to put a Zoom logo in the, let me, let me show the banner that I'm having someone build now uh, of, of what, what I'm talking about. Uh, it's a banner for, let me see if I got it here. Uh, Oh, okay. Here it is. Uh, okay. And let me know if you can see this. So I figured, you know, maybe we should posi change positioning of, of what we're doing to, to be a Zoom specialist, you know, in medicine. Uh, you, you see this connecting yeah, medical? Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I really want to use that Zoom name because people know it now in America. And I think uh, a large part of the world. So we're no longer just connecting medical communities with video, it's connecting with Zoom. Uh, and, and so I foresee hopefully doing, establishing channels in, in all areas of medicine. I mean, it's ambitious, but it's doable now with Zoom. Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. And yeah, you, become, so, you become like TED.com or TEDx, you know, you're a, um, a home for the world's best thinkers on you know, different specialities and different topics. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's worth a shot. And, and, and I don't want to make it, I actively recruit people, but I see certain people that are at the top of the game that are doing video, like this ENT doctor that did one this morning from uh, India. This guy is an ace and, and Simon knows who he is. Uh, but he, he does regular webcasts about ENT. That's his specialty. So yeah, what, what yeah. yeah, you know him, Simon. Yeah, the uh, let me show you his. Uh, so we basically gave him a studio, uh, and he he does regular webcasts from this from the uh, internet medicine. Okay, he he does ENT studio, and he does he does a lot of webcasts. Uh, he's an excellent teacher. Uh, so when I see a guy like that, I just approach him and say, hey, look, I want to distribute your video on the channel. So that's how I hope to basically grow it, is to get the people that are at the top of the game and get them to do uh, regular shows. Because most of them know what the tech is and they know what we're trying to do. Uh, other people might think, oh, I'm trying to rip them off and make money. <laughs> 
No, we're just trying to get more views for your channel and yeah. more distribution. It's educational. You know, you're sharing you're sharing the knowledge of you know yeah. wonderful speakers. Yeah, hopefully Absolutely. they'll see it that way. The, 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 and I think most of the guys do. They say, "Oh, you got to show my show where where else beside what I'm doing." But like this afternoon, I'm doing one from Argentina uh, on stro uh, strokes uh, in wow. Spanish. And this guy, let me oh, let me show you. Let me show you his. Um, Sorry, I gotta I gotta take off. I, I only slept a couple hours last yeah, night. Yeah, sure, dog. Thanks Sorry. for coming. Nice, to meet you, nice to meet you. Yeah. And, uh, Good luck. We'll yeah. talk to you later. Okay. Talk to you soon. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Okay. Let me let me Bye. get you this. Uh... Okay. Let's see. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yesterday in organization from Zambia. Zambia nurses. <laughs> so will you do a channel for me? I said, Yeah, we'll do a channel for you. Because really, for me to build that studio page takes 10 minutes. 10 minutes wow. to build. And, and you want a studio, DR made studio? Um, boom, 10 minutes, it's there. And all I do is uh, do regular Zooms and put them on that, your studio. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, that's a possible revenue stream. Uh, maybe down the road, say, oh yeah, we're gonna try $50, $100 for the studio per month. We'll do shows to you and you got your studio. Uh, I think there'll be an increasing need for people to want to do that because most people don't know how to promote. You know, they don't know that. And, and they, the technical part of Zoom, they don't know that they, they have a close alliance with Facebook and it's easy to promote and stuff. They just want to make the video like, a, a, like the doctor from India. They're too busy. They don't have time to get that tech they don't have time. Uh, a lot of paces to the jigsaw. Yeah, exactly. They just don't have time. They make great videos, but they don't know what the hell to do with them. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, said, Joe. Yeah, well, you know, the exciting news. Uh, we got the top neurosurgeon in the world is going to be next week. Oh, wow. He's, his name's, speaking of artificial intelligence, I'll, I'll tell you this. He's, his name is Yuha Hernandez Nami. He's one of the top in the world. Everybody knows him in the world. I would say the top one or two in the world. Anyways, we've done some webcasts with him and he wants to do one in China. He's in China now because the Chinese lured him there. Uh, he, and they must be paying him a bunch of money because he's been there for like two years. Um, and it's hard to get to him technically because the Chinese, as you probably know, not many people speak English. It's difficult, the communication. But he's doing a show next week. And guess what he's getting into? Artificial intelligence. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So that's how this worked. You know. I'll tune into that one, John. Well, you know, he's doing things that affect him what you're talking about, the glioblastoma. He's going to be in the forefront of research in a place that's the best place in the world to do research and brain things. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah. he's, 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 he's not going to give the webcast next week. He's going to give it a neurosurgery. But I talked to his assistant uh, who works with him. And he says, oh, you uh, agreed to get involved with uh, this big artificial intelligence guy. So hopefully we'll be able to rope him into the webcast, the artificial intelligence guy. And we'll kind of blend, hopefully, blend some artificial intelligence in the neurosurgical community because they're interested. When you say robotics or to a neurosurgeon, they're like the ears go up. Oh, really? Because they want to keep on top of things. Yeah, they really want. That's what it, that's what this is all about: keeping on top. You're right. Yeah. So okay, I guess I bent your ear enough. You're okay. In. No, I find this fascinating, John, and you know, I love your work. You know, I like to get David roused him yeah. out of bed. <laughs> Let me see if I can roust him out of bed. Oh, <laughs> well, he's probably at the pub, uh, the pub playing his or is whatever. Oh no, he's not at the pub. No, it's pub's closed. closed. Pub's Everything's closed. closed. That's that's right. He'll be see. busy busy doing his doctor work, the three G doctor. No, he's uh, yeah, he's actually working now, right? Mm. I think he's working. Yeah, the other day I, I was on a call with him, but he had to go to uh, an ambulance run. So he seems to be working. 
Yeah, yeah, great guy. Let me see if I can get hold of him. Oh, I, I tell you, we ran a conference from hell. And I, I, uh, I single-handedly probably half destroyed his website. <laughs> and we laugh about it, you know. You know, it was so bad. It was so, and actually someone wrote that on YouTube. He said, that was horrible. That's the worst I've ever seen. And I said, I agree. I'm the one that did it. <laughs> uh, imagine that, a presenter eating a sandwich on the air. <laughs> and, and we had and another funny thing is we we had we had this presenter uh, with with uh, ra rather well endowed big boobs. She gave a presentation, and that's all she wanted to show her boobs. She, I mean, the camera shot. Most of the time at a conference, the camera shots the head, right? She had a camera shot of showing her chest. And you could barely see the presentation. You couldn't even read. In other words, the priority wasn't the presentation. The priority was showing off those goddamn boobs. <laughs> and I'm laughing. I was, oh, God, this is a nice. <laughs> and Dave laughs about it, too. He says, yeah, that's, that's a show from hell. <laughs> Well, I'm sure you made shows like that where you go, holy shit. And I <laughs> fucked up on that one. <laughs> Have you ever done shows like that at the beginning? Oh, we've seen it all, John. We've seen we've seen people um, who are on stage referring to charts and graphs and they fall off stage. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, you know, you know, I'm surprised it doesn't happen more often, but uh, uh, yeah, live. Well, yeah, most of those conferences, man. I'm surprised they 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 go most of them without a glitch. But uh, and I haven't seen really many bad ones. But as far as uh, televising, what we're doing, I, I see a lot of people that are just learning it, like like me, making real basic mistakes, mostly with sound. So, yeah. And I, I don't have to tell you how important sound is, but to a lot of these technicians, sound is not important. You know what I mean? I, I'm like twisting their arm to set up. You know, they want to set up 10 minutes before. Have you ever got that? Oh yeah, all the time, yeah. Oh man, that drives me nuts. We had one from Spain, right? In January, I've done it for three years. And they were using a local company to do, you know, the, the televising and the set up the camera and the sound and stuff like that, which was fine. And I said, let's meet a week or two before, just to make sure. Oh, no, we're going to meet the day before. Conference was a disaster. Disaster. The sound went out, and the screen wouldn't work, and this and that. And, and it was like, oh, my God. But the organizer knew it wasn't, wasn't my fault, that I was trying to get the guy to, to you know, I kept repeating, say, it's going to be a disaster. And I was right, unfortunately. <laughs> but... That's part of the game, I guess, for you. So, anyways, okay, we'll let you go. And uh, anytime you you get, sure. uh, you're, you're on the email for these talk. You see them around, right? Yeah, um, and they come through to my mailbox. So, fair play to you. You're doing great with your email marketing. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A pain in the ass, but it's expensive no. to get those those email markets. Or I, I got I got to upgrade to to email out more. But how, many, how many how many is on your mailing list, John? Because you must have a, a lot now. No, 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 I would say about ten thousand, which isn't a lot, because there's fifty thousand neurosurgeons in the world, but it, it costs some money to get that much emails. It, so I'm gonna have to wait to develop more before I do that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I think now's the time to meet money people. Really, I, I, I mean, this is our ch this is my chance mm -hmm. to do something, really. Yeah. You know, like, uh, you know, connecting medicine through Zoom. I mean, I shouldn't go for that huge market of medicine. But you know what? Why not? <laughs> Why not with Zoom? Why not? I'm going to do it in Spanish, too. Let me quickly show you that. That website. The same thing. Is Conectando. Well, I won't show you that. But, but Conectando con Zoom. Con Zoom. And you know the the Spanish market's less competitive than the English. There ain't nothing out there in the Spanish market in in medicine. Hardly anything. 
And, and that's, that's the area where I really think we'll go first uh, as far as meeting investors is Spanish because they, they seem to like the platform a little bit more than Americans and there's no competition. America, as you know, is, I mean, English is lots of things out there. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyways, okay then. Yeah, okay, mate. great chat with you. Okay, great thanks, work. nice chat with you. Thank you very much. No problem. Anytime you need help, John, or anything like that, just give us a shout. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.